up to you, Corny here with chapter five of the last year of Malcolm X, The Evolution of a Revolutionary by George Brightman. Chapter five is called Separatism and Black Nationalism. Along with new moods and trends that appeared in the Negro community in the last decade of Malcolm's life, new words and expressions entered the American vocabulary and old ones changed their meaning. An example is the word integration, about which Malcolm said in the autobiography, the word has no real meaning. I ask you in the racial sense in which it's used so much today, whatever integration is supposed to mean, can it precisely be defined? The trouble is not only that the word is not precisely defined, but that different groups use it to mean different things. When some people speak of integration, they mean any action, court ruling or law that eliminates segregation or discrimination in one or more areas. They call it integration if one Negro is added to a police force, or if five Negro children are admitted to a previously all white school. <clears throat> Some in this group assert that integration already exists in the North and that the task is to make the South like the North. Others hold that society is not yet integrated in the North, but that it will become integrated by the, by the addition of separate acts of desegregation one by one over an indefinite period of time. Integration. Integration, thus defined, is condemned and rejected by many black people as tokenism and gradualism. It is not that they object to the desegregation of any one or more areas, but that they see this concept of integration as a trick or device for denying them genuine and complete freedom now or in the foreseeable future. Please like the video. A second way in which integration is used as complete assimilation James Farmer says that this until recently was what he had and core meant by, was what he and core meant, excuse me, by integration and sought to achieve. It is still objective of the more conservative civil rights group. Groups. Complete assimilation says Farmer is an ideal of ultimate goodness under which there would be a, a kind of random dispersal of Negroes throughout the society and economy. There would be no Negro neighborhoods. America would be a land of individuals who were American and nothing else. But some Negroes, including most of those in uh, core in 1966 have concluded that while this concept of integration may be fine as an ideal, it is too remote or impractical to serve present needs. Others are openly hostile to it. They don't want to be dispersed because they have racial pride because they prefer to live together. Or because dispersal could be a method of dividing Negroes physically and reducing their ability to defend their common interests against whites, whose good intentions they have little reason to believe in. <clears throat> There were and are interpretations and definitions, but these are enough to explain why Malcolm did not accept integration as his goal. Another word used in several different ways is separation. This should not under any circumstances be confused with a segregation, a system that is imposed on blacks by whites. Liberals often insist on equating the two. Sometimes separation refers to a tendency among black people in this country favoring their withdrawal into a nation of their own, either in Africa or in a portion of the territory that now makes up the United States. And what follows the word separatism will be used wherever possible to denote this particular concept of separation. At other times, separation is used as the opposite of assimilation, integration as complete as assimilation. Thus, a black man may advocate separation to signify his hostility to being assimilated and his desire for the continued protection and warmth of the Negro community, either in the America of today or, or in a future desegregated America. The emphasis here is on the voluntary preservation of a Negro community inside the United States, as opposed to its disappearance, whereas separatism favors the withdrawal of Negroes into a nation outside or apart from the United States. <clears throat> I'm gonna read the footnote here. It says, integration is irrelevant, said Stokely Carmichael in the spring of 1966, after he became chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordin um, Coordinating Committee, that is SNCC, and was charged with taking it down the Malcolm X Road. <clears throat> 
back to the primary text. Separation is also used sometimes in a narrower and organizational sense. While certain Negro leaders insist that there must be integration in the organizations in the freedom movement, by which they mean that their composition must be interracial, some Black people insist that there must be separation in the freedom movement by which they mean that all black organizations must lead the movement and decide its policies. It should be noted that the goals of an organization cannot be deduced merely from its racial composition. There have been and are all black organizations whose goal is integration. One of the best known was A. Philip Randolph's Negro March on Washington Monument movement in the 1940s which was formed on an all black basis because that was believed to be the best way to recruit Negroes. Although its objectives were the ending of discrimination and segregation and employment and the armed forces, it was for separation as an organizational form, but against separation in every other case and every other sense. Malcolm was and remained in favor of maintaining and strengthening the Negro community. And he was and remained in favor of all black organization and the struggle for freedom, but he changed his views on separatism in the last year of his life. Another term requiring examination is one that was most frequently applied to Malcolm after he left the black Muslims, and that is black nationalism. Not much light on this subject can be gleaned from most of the press, white or Negro. As they employ it, black nationalism is little more than an epithet, black supremacy, racism in reverse, the black counterpart of the Ku, Ku Kluxism, etc. All you can learn, or um, there's actually a footnote here. It says, during the Mississippi March to Jackson in June 1966, SNCC, Chairman Stokely Carmichael, Stokely Carmichael was repeatedly pressed with the questions from TV and newspapers asking if he was a black nationalist. Black nationalism in this country means anti-white, Carmichael said. That's the trick they're trying to put me in. Back to the main text. All you can learn about black nationalism from this source is that you can't learn about black nationalism from this source. <laughs> It is also difficult, unfortunately, to get a clear picture of black nationalism as a tendency in the United States for many of the people and groups that consider themselves black nationalists. Although they share a common designation, they are divided over a definition and disagree, sometimes sharply over important questions of policy and program. Someday the situation may change. Someday the, the many small black nationalist groups may come together in a single strong organization or a federation of organizations commanding the allegiance of most people who think of themselves as black nationalists. That is, someday black nationalism may become a movement rather than a tendency or a group of tendencies. When that occurs, black nationalism will come to mean what the movement stands for both among the masses and the professors who compile dictionaries. Most academic attempts at a definition so far have created as many problems as they have solved. Instead of starting with a study of African-American black nationalists, their ideas and activities, and deriving their definition from that, they too often tend to start with a definition of national nationalism in general, then stick the word black in front of it and think the work is done when it has hardly begun. One wonders how they would have proceeded if the tendency where we are discussing had chosen or been given another name, say black internationalism, which would have been as appropriate as the name they now have. Where would we get an analysis of the German Nazi movement, which called itself national socialism? If we began with the definition of socialism in general, then put the word national in front of that. If we understand that the nature of a thing or tendency has primacy, has primacy over the name given it, if we put the name in a subordinate position and do not let it detract or over influence us, then black nationalism can be seen as approximately the following. It is the tendency for black people in the United States to unite as a group, as a people, into a movement their own into a movement of their own to fight for freedom, justice, and equality. Animated by the desire of an oppressed minority to decide its own destiny, this tendency holds that black people must control their own movement and the political, economic, and social institutions of the black community. Its characteristic attributes include racial pride, group consciousness, hatred of white supremacy, a striving for independence from white control, and identification with black and non-white oppressed groups and other parts of the world. 
This was what James Farmer was talking about when he said that black nationalism is a dominant mood of the Negro masses in the United States today. This was what C. Eric Lincoln was writing about in 1964 when he coined the term mood ebony to describe the sentiment growing among African, uh, growing among American Negroes. Although he tried rather unsuccessfully to distinguish this mood ebony from black nationalism. And this was what he meant earlier in the century when people referred to someone as a race man. Understood in this light, it is plain that black nationalism in the United States today does have some of the features of nationalism in general, or what the academians call classic or ideal or model nationalism. And that is similar in certain respects to the black nationalism found in Africa. But it also differs in at least one basic respect from both classic nationalism and African black nationalism. The thing that is unique about it is that is despite its name, is that despite its name, it does not share or does not yet share a commitment to a struggle for a separate black nation, what we have above termed separatism. One can be both a black nationalist and a separatist, but one can also be a black nationalist without being a separatist. How long this will be true, no one can foretell, but it is already possible to see the two directions in which the present situation can change. If racism completely eliminated in the near future, and that will take a profoundly revolutionary reconstruction of the American economy, political structure, and educational system, then the reasons for the existence of black nationalism will disappear, and it may fade away before becoming separatist. But if racism is not uprooted soon, and if black people reach the conclusion that full equality is not attainable in the foreseeable future, separatist moods and activities are sure to grow among Negroes as a whole as well as among those who can now be considered black nationalists. In that case, the historical judgment will be that black nationalism in its present phase was only embryonic, incipient, and not fully developed, and that its transformation into separatism or classic nationalism was inevitable. As a black Muslim leader, or excuse me, it says, to grasp the full meaning of the evolution of Malcolm's thinking that is documented in this chapter, it helps to know that Malcolm began in 1964 to make this distinction between black nationalism and separatism. As a black Muslim leader, Malcolm preached separatism with the same vigor that he did the rest of Elijah Muhammad's doctrine. In his last speech as a black Muslim on December 1st, 1963, when he made the chickens come home to roost remark, he presented it as follows. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that a desegregated theater or lunch counter won't solve our problems. Better jobs won't even solve our problems. An integrated cup of, co a cup of coffee isn't sufficient to pay for 400 years of slave labor and a better job in the white man's factory or position in his business. It's at best only a temporary solution. The only lasting or permanent solution is complete separation on some land that we can call our own. The not so honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that the race problem can easily be solved just by sending these 22 million ex-slaves back to our own homeland where we can live in peace and harmony with our own kind. But this government should provide the transportation plus everything else we need to get started again in our own country. This government should provide everything we need in machinery, materials, and finance, enough to last from up to 20 to 25 years until we can become an independent people in our own country. If this white government is afraid to let 22 million ex-slaves go back to our own country and to our own people, then, Amer then America must set aside some separate territory here in the Western Hemisphere, where the two races can live apart from one another, where we can, where we certainly don't get along peacefully while we're still uh, here, while we're here together. The size of the territory can be judged according to our own population. If our people number one seventh of America's total population, then give us one seventh of the land. We don't want any land in the desert, but where there is rain and much mineral wealth. We want fertile, productive land on which we can farm and provide our own people with sufficient food, clothing, and shelter. This government must supply us with the machinery and other tools needed to dig into the earth. Give us everything we need Give us everything we need for them for 20 to 25 years until we can produce and supply our own needs. If we are a part of America, then part of what she is worth 
also belongs to us. We will take our share and depart, then this white country can have peace. What is her net worth? Give us our share in gold and silver and let us depart and go back to our own homeland in peace. We want no integration with this wicked race that enslaved us. We want complete separation from this race of devils, but we should not be ex accepted, um, expected to go back to our own homeland empty handed. After 400 years of slave labor, we have some back pay coming, a bill owed to us that must be collected. And if you're just coming in here, this is um, the final speech that Malcolm X gave as a, a member of the Nation of Islam. Returning to the text, it reads, if the government of white America truly repents of its sins against our people and atones by giving us our true share, only then can America save herself. But if America waits for almighty God himself to step in and force her into a just settlement, God will take this entire continent away from her and she will cease to exist as a nation. White America, wake up and take heed before it's too late. That's the end of that speech. But what if white America would not wake up and take heed? Would the only solution have to wait for Almighty God to step in? Malcolm's ability as a speaker enabled him to extract from the separatist theme all the emotional appeal it held for people resentful towards the tokenism that is called integration. But it could not conceal the fact that the Black Muslim method or program for achieving separatism was vague and indefinite or the fact which Malcolm was to acknowledge after the split that at no time did he, Elijah Muhammad, ever enter into any activity or action that was designed to bring any of this into existence. In his last months as a black Muslim, Malcolm remained orthodox when speaking to the members of the Nation of Islam and assigned the main role in achieving separatism to Allah. But when he spoke to non-Muslim Negroes, as in his Detroit speech on November 10th, 1963, he transferred the question from the religious sphere to the political, discussing separation and black nationalism and revolution as though they were all the same thing. He implied that Allah could use human help, revolutionary help. Malcolm says, when you want a nation, that's called nationalism. When the white man became involved in a revolution in this country against England, what was it for? He wanted this land so he could set up another white nation. That's white nationalism. The French Revolution was white nationalism. The Russian Revolution, yes, it was white nationalism. You don't think so? Why do you think Khrushchev and Mao can't get their head heads together? White nationalism. All the revolutions that are going on in Asia and Africa today are based on what? Black nationalism. A revolutionary is a black nationalist. He wants a nation. If you're afraid of black nationalism, you're afraid of revolution. And if you love revolution, you love black nationalism. That's the end of that speech. When the split came, Malcolm's position began to change, but the change was partial and gradual. At the March 12, 1964 press conference where he announced the formation of the Muslim Mosque, Inc., he said... I still believe that Mr. Muhammad's analysis of the problem is the most realistic and that his solution is the best one. This means that I too believe the best solution is complete separation with our people going back home to our own African homeland. But separation back to Africa is still a long range program. And while it is yet to materialize, 22 million of our people who are still here in America need better food, clothing, housing, education, and jobs right now. Our political philosophy will be black nationalism. Our economic and social philosophy will be black nationalism. Our cultural emphasis will be black nationalism. The political philosophy of black nationalism means we must control the politics and politicians of our community. They must no longer take orders from outside forces. We will organize and sweep out of office all Negro politicians who are puppets for the outside forces. Thus, Malcolm, oh, and that's the end of that speech. <clears throat> Thus, Malcolm did not reject complete separation at the time of the split. He still embraced it, but now he put it in the category of long range program, an ultimate rather than an immediate objective. He did not call his new movement separatist. He gave it the designation of black nationalist to distinguish it from the nation of Islam, which had never called itself that, which had never called itself that. 
One week later, in his March 19 interview with A.B. Spellman, Malcolm interjected when Spellman asked about his program for achieving your goals of separation. He said, a better word to use than separation is independence. This word separation is misused. The 13 colonies separated from England, but they called it the Declaration of Independence. They don't call it the Declaration of Separatism. They call it the Declaration of Independence. When you're independent of someone, you can separate from them. If you can't separate from them, it means you're not independent of them. But Spellman had only used the term used by Malcolm himself earlier in the interview. I believe that Elijah Muhammad's, this is Malcolm. I believe that Elijah Muhammad's analysis of the race problem is the best one and his solution is the only one. The political philosophy of a Muslim mosque will be black nationalism. The economic philosophy will be black nationalism and the social philosophy will be black nationalism. And by political philosophy, I mean still, I mean, we still believe in the honorable Oh, it, it kills me to read uh, honorable next to this man's name because of what he did with all those girls. But that's what the book says. Believe in the honorable Elijah Muhammad solution as complete separation. The 22 million so-called Negroes should be separated completely from America and should be permitted to go back home to our African homeland, which is a long range program. So the short range program is that we must eat while we're still here. We must have a place to sleep. We must have clothes to wear. We must have better jobs. We must have better education so that although our long range political philosophy is to migrate back to our African homeland, our short range program must involve that which is necessary to enable us to live a better life while we are still here. We must be in complete control of the politics of the so-called Negro community. We must gain complete control over the politicians in the so-called Negro community that, so that no outsider will have any voice in the so-called Negro community. At this point, early in the transition period, there was still room in Malcolm's exposition of the Black nationalism for separation um, back to Africa. But it was soon to drop out altogether, even as a long range objective. On April 3rd, when he spoke at a core rally, C-O-R-E, in Cleveland, on the ballot or the bullet, Malcolm began to explain black nationalism from a somewhat different angle. So Elijah Muhammad and um, Muhammad Ibn Abdullah are two totally separate, different people. Elijah Muhammad, whose real last name is Poole, was the guy who said that he was a prophet of God and some kind of innate leader of African-Americans. He was actually some kind of a East Indian subcontinent guy in terms of race. However, when you're talking about raisin heads, that is true and not true at the same time. Muslims refer to people as what they look like. So the prophet Muhammad, who was Muhammad ibn Abdullah, as in the son of a man called Abdullah, who was the son of a man named Abdul Muttalib. So Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, right? He said, may the blessings and pieces of Allah be, peace of Allah be upon him. The prophet Muhammad said, the actual Arab prophet Muhammad from centuries ago said, you should follow a righteous leader, even if he is a raisin head Ethiopian. Now, the reason he said raisin head, or was that him? It was either him, Abu Bakr, or Umar al Khattab who said this, right? It was a Khalifa. Now, here's the deal if you're talking about an Ethiopian, what, what does it look like? Small head, dark curly hair. It looks like a raisin, right? You can call somebody a melon head. You can call somebody, you know, gimpy leg. You can call somebody short, stocky, white, looks like sugar cane, whatever it is. But make no mistake, the Prophet Muhammad was an orphaned child, dead parents. 
He was raised by a black woman. His sister is a black woman. And some of the women he loved the most and guaranteed uh, paradise to, like the first martyr of Islam was a black woman. And one of his best friends was a man named Bilal ibn Rabah, who was a black man who his best friend Abu Bakr freed from slavery. The prophet Muhammad was no racist. The Arabic language is descriptive. It's not a racist comment if you understand the Arabic language, but if you're translating that comment into English, then yes, it sounds racist. But since I'm an Arabic speaker, I know that it is a descriptor. Carrying on. If, actually, the, the final speech of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was uh, during Hajj al right? So this is his, his final hedge, and he knew that he was dying, right? In his final speech before his death that took place in front of the Jama'ah, or what can be called the Congregation of Muslims, he said, know that a white is not superior to a black, nor is a black superior to a white. Know that an Arab is not superior to a non-Arab, nor is a non-Arab superior to an Arab, except for in piety and good deeds. Now, if you want to know what comes out of the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad, that is something you can Google. You can type in Prophet Muhammad final address, Prophet Muhammad final lecture. And that will come up and you can see that printed in English, Arabic, Malaysian, German, Russian, or any Semitic language. No, the Prophet Muhammad was no racist. Another story, right? Because I'm actually really bothered by this comment. There was a guy, uh, Abu, Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar, right? Abu Dhar was talking talking to the man who I called Bilal ibn, ibn Rabah. He was talking to Bilal, okay? And, and, and Bilal was black, bliggity bliggity black, okay? He was talking, having a conversation with Bilal and he said to him, Ya Ibn Saudah. Oh, Ibn Saudah. You son of a black woman. To insult him, you son of a black woman. That was akin back then in their region to you son of a bitch. And when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa azwajati wa sallam heard that, he was like, Abu Dhar, you, I mean, condemned him as a man who was the representative of God. You have within you the traits of jahiliya. What does it mean, jahiliya? What does it mean to be jahil? Ignorance. He condemned him with the hand of God as an ignorant man until Abu Dhar brought himself to the middle of a desert and put his face on the sand and begged Bilal to walk on his face. He was so scared that a representative of God would condemn, condemn him in such a way. And the first man ever to give the call to prayer in Islam was Bilal ibn Rabah. That is the original Mu'adhid. Do you know what kind of sign the Prophet Muhammad was giving to those Arabs when he put a black former slave on the top of the Kaaba that we face every day in the middle of the desert? Do you know what it meant? to all of those Arabs to see a black man crawl on top of that building and give them the first call to prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Haya Allah Salah, Haya Allah Salah, Haya Allah Falah, Haya Allah Falah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. The first man to ever do that in the history of Islam was a black man. The Prophet Muhammad was no racist. He condemned racists and racism. 
the woman who Muslims trace their lineage through when it comes to how they are related to the father Abraham is Hajim. It's not Sarah. It's the woman you non-Muslims call Hagar. It's the woman you non-Muslims say was the what was uh, the concubine of Abraham. We say no such thing of her. We believe that she was an honored wife, that once she was given by the Pharaoh as a slave to Ibrahim, alayhi salam, his wife said, no, marry her. And she conceived that child. It's a story all over the Bible you can figure out. That was an Egyptian slave. What color were Egyptian slaves? When we run back and forth between Safa and Marwa, do you know that we did that because a black woman did it first? A black woman did it first. The well we have where we drink the Zamzam water, do you know that it was a well given to a black woman, a former slave out of the land of Egypt? The prophet Muhammad was no racist was no racist. When you translate things from a Semitic language into a non-Semitic language, you don't understand them and you get and you pull them out of their culture, out of their context, and you get something that you can only understand with your English American mind. to the text. <clears throat> In core meetings, it's being taught that SNCC meetings uh it's being taught in Muslim meetings. It's being taught where nothing but atheists and agnostics come together. It's being taught everywhere. If black nationalism meant no more than the, than the Negro's control of his own community, of his own politics, and did not necessarily require a belief in separatism, then Malcolm was completely justified in seeing elements of black nationalism developing in organizations that were strongly opposed to back to Africa separatism. At any rate, his explanation of black nationalism in Cleveland did not contain even a mention of separation or separatism. Five days later, Malcolm spoke on the black revolution at the militant labor forum in New York, like the Cleveland speech, it was a presentation and defense of the Black Nationalist outlook. At one point, Malcolm X said, all of our people have the same goals, the same objective. That objective is freedom, justice, and equality. All of us want recognition and respect as human beings. We don't want to be integrationists, nor do we want to be separationists. We want to be human beings. Integration is only a method that is used by some groups to obtain freedom. Justice, equality, and respect as human beings. Separation is only a method that is used by other groups to obtain freedom, justice, equality, and human dignity. Our people have made the mistake of confusing the methods with the objectives. As long as we agree on objectives, we should never fall out with each other just because we believe in different methods or tactics of strategy to reach a common objective. We have to keep in mind at all times that we are not fighting for integration, nor are we fighting for separation. We are fighting for recognition as human beings. We are fighting for the right to live as humans in this society. Um, I'm sure you didn't mean to trigger me the way that you did, and I'm uh, very sorry for going off like that, but... Um, We can talk about the way that I dress. We can talk about the, some of the things that I do. Uh, we can talk about me being hijabless. We can talk about me being all kind of whatever, but all of the prophets are sacred to me, every last one of them. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Jacob, all of them, they're sacred to me and I believe in them. So I take them as personally as I take uh, my family. So uh, back to the text, it says, that was certainly a lot different from the March 12th and March 19th statements. Later in this New York meeting, during the discussion period, Malcolm was asked a question which gave him an opportunity to discuss the relation between black nationalism and separatism. The question written out referred to as a statement in the pamphlet Freedom Now, a new stage in the struggle for Negro emancipation containing the Socialist Workers Party's 1963 convention resolution. But Malcolm did not choose to use the question to expound his views on separatism. Instead, he said <clears throat> a pamphlet freedom now is on sale in the back good plug and it contains the statement all separatists are nationalists but not all nationalists are separatists 
I don't know anything about that. What is your view on this? Can one be a black nationalist even though not in, interested in a separate independent black nation? Similarly, is every integrationist necessarily an assimilationist? Well, as I said earlier, the black people I know don't want to be integrationists, nor do they want to be separationists. They want to be human beings. Some of them choose integration, thinking that this method will bring them respect as a human being. Others choose separation, thinking that this method or tactic will bring them respect as a human being. But they've had so much trouble attaining their objectives that they've gotten their methods mixed up with their objectives. And now, instead of calling themselves human beings, they're calling themselves integrationists and separationists, and they don't have either one. No. So I don't know about integrationists and the assimilationists and the separationists, but I do know about the segregationists. That's the Americans. So there were three different positions expressed in the transition period. Uh, at first, Malcolm reaffirmed his belief in separatism. Then he implied that one could be a black nationalist without being a separatist. And then he showed, what does it say? And then he showed a lack of interest in discussing separatism altogether. On April 13th, Malcolm left for Mecca in Africa where he had discussions that led to big changes in his thinking on separatism and black nationalism. At a press conference held on the day of his return to New York, May 21st, most of the questioning concerned Malcolm's revised views on race. But he was also asked if he still thought Negroes should return to Africa. Malcolm X replied that after speaking to African leaders, he was convinced that if black men become involved in a philosophical, cultural, and psychological migration back to Africa, they will benefit greatly in this country. He compared this to the benefits he said Jews had derived from their identification with Israel. He went on to say that many African countries would welcome American Negroes, but that he thought Negroes should stay and fight in the U.S. for what was rightfully theirs. This remained Malcolm's position until the end. After his second trip to Africa, he told uh, Harry You Act, mm, Harry You Act Forum in Harlem that is spelled H A R Y O U. Harry You Act Forum in Harlem on December 12, 1964, about the only kind of migration he favored. And he says this. I believe this, that if we migrated back to Africa culturally, philosophically, and psychologically, while remaining here physically, the spiritual bond that would develop between us and Africa through this cultural, philosophical, and psychological migration, so-called migration, would enhance our position here because we would have our contacts with them as act acting as roots or foundations behind us. And this is what I mean by a migration or going back to Africa, going back in the sense that we reach out to them and they reach out to us. Our mutual understanding and our mutual effort toward a mutual objective will bring mutual benefits to the African as well as to the Afro-American. To Pierre Burton's question on January 19, 1965, but you no longer believe in a black state? He gave the flat answer, no. <laughs> He says, no, I believe in a society in which people can live like human beings on the basis of equality. Bada bing, bada boom. And on January 24th, he read to an OAAU rally the text of a telegram he had sent to George Lincoln Rockwell, head of the American Nazi Party. He disassociated himself not only from the absent abstentionism, but also from the separatism of the nation of Islam. This is to warn you that I am no longer held in check from fighting white supremacists by Elijah Muhammad separatist black Muslim movements. <laughs> While Malcolm never publicly stated why he was changing his position on separatism, it is clear that he stopped advocating it. Even as, even as a long range position, by the end of the transition period, what was not noticed at that time and was not discussed publicly for many months after that by Malcolm or anyone else was that he also began to reconsider the whole question of black nationalism following his trip to Africa in the spring of 1964. The first time Malcolm talked about this to any Americans outside of his associates in the OAAU was five weeks before his death. On January 18th, 1965, he gave an interview to representatives of the Young Socialists, and this is how he answered their questions. How do you define, how do you define black nationalism with which you have been identified? He says, I used to define black nationalism as the idea that the black man should control the economy of his community, the politics of his community and so forth. But when I was in Africa in May in Ghana, I was speaking with an Algerian ambassador who was extremely militant and is a revolutionary in the true sense of the word. 
and has his credentials as such for having carried on a successful revolution against oppression in this country. When I told him that my political, social, and economic philosophy was black nationalism, he asked me frankly, very frankly, well, where did that leave him? Because he was white. He was an African, but he was an Algerian. And to all appearances, he was a white man. And he said, if I define my objective, objective as the victory of black nationalism, where does that leave him? Where does that leave revolutionaries in Morocco, in Egypt, in Iraq, in Mauritania? So he showed me where I was alienating people who were true revolutionaries dedicated to the overthrowing of the system of exploitation that exists on this earth by any means necessary. Woo. On returning from his first African trip, Malcolm wrote that the Algerian ambassador had a razor sharp mind and was well versed in the principles of re revolution. His image of militant sincerity is still strongly pictured in my mind. We are all blood brothers, Liberator, July 1964. The author, after being informed by the Algerian mission to the United Nations uh, that the Algerian ambassador to Ghana in May 1964 was Mr. Tahir Qaid. He wrote to him, both the Algerian embassy and, and Accra. So Accra is, is the capital of Ghana, anyhow, capital city. And at the Algerian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Algiers, asking him if he could supply information for this book about his discussions with Malcolm. Unfortunately, these letters were not sent until after the Bin Bella regime had been overthrown in Algeria and the Nkrumah regime had been overthrown in Ghana. This may explain why no reply was received. Getting back to the text, it says, so I had a lot, so I had to do a lot of thinking and reappraising re re of my definition of black nationalism. Can we sum up the solution to the problems confronting our people as black nationalism? And if you notice, I haven't been using the expression for several months, right? So Malcolm hadn't been saying the words black nationalism anywhere for several months. But I still would be hard pressed to give a specific definition of the overall philosophy, which I think is necessary for the liberation of the black people in this country. <clears throat> Actually, Malcolm had not altogether abandoned the expression black nationalism. He had virtually stopped calling himself in the OAAU black nationalist. But since everyone else continued to call him by that label, and since he did not yet have an alternative label, he would accept it. He would accept its uh, continued use in discussion and debate. Thus, for example, in his first reference to the OAAU in a radio panel discussion over station um, WINS on February 18th, 1965, he carefully stated that it is considered nationalist. No one on the panel paid the slightest attention to this, a formulation, but kept on calling Malcolm and his movement black nationalists. And the subsequent changes, excuse me, and the subsequent exchanges, Malcolm did the same instead of continuing to make the distinction. It was not until after the publication of the Young Socialist interview, a few days after Malcolm X's death, that anyone looked back to see when Malcolm stopped calling himself a black nationalist. It was at the end of May, right after his first trip abroad in 1964. On his return from that trip, Malcolm spent the whole month of June organizing the, AAU, the OAAU in New York. When he had formed the Muslim Mosque Inc. in March, he had said that it was a black it was black nationalist. He did not say this about OAAU at its first meeting on June 28, 1964, nor that the statement of basic aims and objectives of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which he made public at that meeting, make any reference whatever to black nationalism. Early in 1965, Malcolm announced that the OAAU was preparing a new program. It was to be presented in printed form by the OAAU at an Audubon rally on February 15, 1965, but Malcolm's home was bombed on February 14th. And the February 15th rally was devoted to discussion mainly of that event. Presentation of the new basic unity program dated February 15th was postponed to a subsequent meeting and Malcolm was assassinated at the next meeting. But the basic, but the basic unity program did not call the OAAU black nationalists. It never even mentioned the expression. 
Is it correct to still speak of Malcolm as a black nationalist when we know that he had stopped calling himself that and was questioning the adequacy of black nationalism as the quote unquote solution to the problems confronting our people? The answer is yes. Okay, author, I disagree with you. But the author says the answer is yes, if we continue to use the definition of black nationalism attempted earlier in this chapter. Malcolm became, I, I disagree wholeheartedly. If he didn't call himself that, why should you? Anyhow, Malcolm became a black nationalist while he was in prison in the late 1940s. It was the starting point for all his thinking, the source of his strength and dynamism. I would disagree there as well. And he remained a black nationalist to his last hour. However uncertain he became about what to call himself or the program that he was trying to formulate. Okay, so now I see the author's point, but I still disagree. The most urgent need of the Negro people is their mobilization and unification into an independent movement to fight their freedom, to fight for their freedom. Black nationalism contributes to that process in much the way that class consciousness contributes to the formation of an independent movement of workers for their emancipation from exploitation. But black nationalism is a means, not the end. It is a means, but not only the means. It is probably an indispensable means toward the solution, but it is not the solution itself. It helps to build an independent movement, but it does not by itself provide the program that will lead such movement to victory any more than class consciousness by itself supplies all the answers for the workers. Light can be shed on Malcolm's repraisal. If we understand that there is more than one variety of black nationalists, Relevant, uh, relevant to this discussion is the variety that can be called pure and simple. This was, this was first discussed in a 1964 series of articles later published under the title Marxism and the Negro Struggle. The pure and simple black nationalist is concerned exclusively or primarily with the internal problems of the Negro community, with organizing it, with helping it to gain control of the community's politics, economy, etc. He is not concerned or is less concerned with the problems of the total American society or with the nature of the larger society within the Negro community exists. He has no theory or a program for changing that society. For him, that is the white man's problem. At a New York symposium sponsored by the Committee to Aid the Monroe Defendants on May 1st, 1962, Malcolm, after speaking on police brutality against blacks, was asked from the audience to comment on the fact that police were also brutal to whites. He said, As black people against whom atrocity and brutality have been practiced in this country, since we first landed here by the whites, we are not interested in the hell that whites catch from whites. We're interested in solving our own problems first. That's your problem. We're not interested in it. That was the reply of a pure and simple black nationalist. We have already quoted Malcolm's statement to A.B. Spellman early in the transition period. We have got to get our problem solved first. And then if there's anything left to work with on the white man's problem, good. That too was typical pure and simple black nationalism. But while Malcolm was that kind of black nationalist in the transition period, he did not remain that kind. Uh, where was I? That's what I get for clicking on anything. Um, as he held discussions with people in Africa, in the Middle East and in the United Nations, and in the United States, as he studied and thought and learned, he moved beyond pure and simple black nationalism toward black nationalism plus. Plus what? Radicalism. The third chapter of this book has already shown from Malcolm's speeches and interviews that he was coming to the conclusion that radical changes have to be made in the society as a whole if black people are to achieve their freedom. This did not contradict his belief that blacks should control their own community. It was an addition to that belief. Okay, so there's um, no. I don't know if your comments are deleted or not, but my moderators have uh, full autonomy. I trust them. So if they delete your comments, block your accounts, uh, it is what it is. <sighs> uh, they, they, they have blue wrenches to take precedence uh, in the chat to literally moderate it. Um, but if you want to know if I'm blocking your comments, the answer is no. I've got uh, both of my hands on this book. And when I take them off, it's to, it's to highlight your comments. The solution cannot be summed up as black nationalism. That means black nationalism plus fundamental social change plus the transformation of the whole society. 
Malcolm still was looking for the name, but he was becoming black nationalist plus revolutionary. This is the final page, by the way. We know he had great respect for the latter term, he may have hesitated to apply it to himself out of modesty or because he thought it would be an added handicap in this country. What he was questioning about the black nationalism was not its essence, but its pure and simple form. He was questioning this because it was alienating people who were true revolutionaries in this case, white revolutionaries. A pure and simple black nationalist wouldn't care what effect it had on whites, revolutionary or not. Malcolm cared because he intended to work with the right revolutionaries. He knew their collaboration was needed if society was to be transformed. Malcolm was beginning to think about the need to replace capitalism and socialism if racism was to be eliminated. He was not sure if it could be done, and he was not sure how it could be done. But he was beginning to believe that that was the road to be traveled. His uncertainty about the right name to call himself arose from the fact that he was doing something new in the United States. He was on his way to a synthesis of black nationalism and socialism that would be fitting for the American scene and acceptable to the masses in the black ghetto. An example of the tendency of revolutionary nationalism to grow over and into and become merged with socialism can be seen in Cuba, where Castro and his movement began as nationalists. Malcolm did not complete this synthesis before he was assassinated. It remains for others to complete what he began. That is the end of chapter five and the beginning of chapter six. I will be completely honest. Um, there's a lot of the chat that I ended up not reading because um, I saw myself getting upset with somebody who frequents my uh, channel and that's not what I want to do. Um, and here's the deal. I won't block you for disagreeing with me like uh, other people will, but um. I'm subject to letting you have it. Um, the beliefs that I have are hard earned, okay? Um, I'm sure you guys can tell by the way that I read that, you know, I'm more than anything, I'm a student and I study. And sometimes, I mean, I used to pull 16 hour days of reading until my eyes and head hurt and I would just cry and I'd be drained. So the beliefs that I have arrived at they're very hard earned. It's not because somebody told me to, you know, like when you're a kid and your mom tells you, you know, God is good. God is great. Thank you for the food on my plate. Amen. Or when, you know, they tell you, you know, well, well thank Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. You know, say I'm saved and sanctified, right? Those things. I am. Um, I had to fight through learning languages, uh, reading and, and translating uh, Semitic languages and uh, books, holy and otherwise. And uh, the beliefs that I have, I've uh, I have been hard earned. So with that being said, uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but um, well, there's no but. I don't, uh, I shouldn't add it, but I, I should just say, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I <sighs> thank you for spending this, uh, just under an hour with me, 50, uh, 50 something minutes, 53. Whew. Like, share, comment, subscribe. I'm up in a corner and I'm out of here.